is Real Ghost Stories Online. What in the realm of the supernatural is possible? That is the question that our next story ends with. And it's something to really think about as you hear and go through the events we're about to share. Obviously, there are very real conditions that people have that are not related to the paranormal or ghosts or spirits. They are mental conditions. They are conditions that our body can be in due to imbalances and various different situations and conditions, traumas, things of that nature that form and shape the way we see and react to the world around us. And then there are, of course, as you know, if you listen to this program on a regular basis, uh, many situations that people are put into where they experience very real things that are not related to a trauma. They're not related to a mental condition. They are simply there. They're unexplained. They're not anything that we can necessarily control. How we react to those things is key to, I think, how we will eventually process them and deal with them in our lives. They can certainly turn into traumas if not dealt with properly. When you have someone who suffers from a mental condition and then is also being attacked in a paranormal or spiritual way, it can be very confusing. Very confusing not only for the individual going through that experience, but those around them trying to identify what here that this person is experiencing is in fact part of their condition and what part is something external that is trying to hurt them, trying to manipulate them, trying to scare them, trying to incite fear into them and essentially play on those weaknesses that someone is suffering from. We see that all too often. We're negative energy, entities, whatever you want to call it, take advantage of weak points in one's life, in one's psyche, and use it to their advantage. Their next story very much deals with all of that. Take a listen. What happened the last Wednesday night in the early 2000s on an April evening, I'll never forget. For starters, I'll give some background. My girlfriend Sarah lives with her friend Jen in a house. Names have been changed for protection. Jen owns the house and has for almost two years. Jen has a very well-paying job, is single, and has chosen to pay off the large mortgage faster than is necessary. On top of all that, she's unhappy about work, constantly worries about her life, and exercises often pushes herself to extreme. She's a good person, though, and we all love her. Her family is of Ukrainian heritage, and they go to Ukraine sometimes, and it was there years ago that Jen brought back with her a spirit of a little girl who looks to have died in the famine of the 1930s in Ukraine. For more information, look up Stalin, 1930s Ukrainian Famine. This little girl visits Jen in her dreams on a regular basis and is always a calm dream and never bad or uncomfortable. Lately, the spirit has materialized in solid physical form, both times in the form of my girlfriend. Wednesday night, I was sleeping over at my girlfriend's place. We went to bed at 10 p.m. and fell asleep quickly as usual. At 12.30 a.m., we were suddenly awoken by Jen screaming outside Sarah's room in the basement. She was screaming, Sarah, Sarah, repeatedly. Sarah put her robe on. I quickly followed to see that Jen was on the ground rocking back and forth, saying to herself or us, I don't know. I don't know. Repeatedly. We asked her many times what happened, and Jen would alternate between the words ice, ice, ice. I don't know. I don't know. And thaw, thaw, thaw. From her one and two word sentences, we found out that she had been 
seeing something in her room that frightened her. The phrase, I don't know, referred to that she didn't know why she had seen these things. The word ice meant that she was cold all over. And the word thaw referred to the fact that she felt like she was thawing. When she was cold, she grabbed her Bible and held it close to her stomach. At that point in her body, she felt the Bible warm her from the inside. And her insides would grow warmer and warmer, therefore feeling like a thaw. At this point, we were able to calm her down just enough to find out what she saw. We were able to guess from our questions and her nods and shakes of her head and talking to her afterwards that she was not able to get to sleep last night as usual. She closed her eyes and after laying there for a half hour, thinking with all her thoughts, she felt something evil in her room. She opened her eyes to see five small shadow people, about four feet tall beside her bed. They had eyes of some sort and small white jagged teeth. She also saw the spirit of the little girl up above her, and she described the girl's expression as unhappy and looking at the shadows. Jen was terrified, and she crouched towards her headboard as the five shadow people got closer. Then, without warning, the spirit of the little girl waved her arm from outside to inside and threw Jen off her bed, and Jen ran out. Jen called her sister in a panic, but her sister didn't recognize the voice on the other side, but stayed on just because... She was concerned for whoever this was. Jen tried to run a bath to calm down and talk, but couldn't do either. Or she collapsed by the bathtub. Jen hung up on the phone and was able to crawl to the downstairs landing and run downstairs screaming for Sarah. After calming Jen down, she was not out of the woods yet. She was still very terrified and would take in air but not breathe out. She was ventilating improperly. She'd pass out for 5 to 15 seconds without breathing out. We decided to take Jen to the hospital, but she refused to go and certainly did not want to go in an ambulance. We told her, either we drive her or she goes in an ambulance. Hospital was not far, but Jen did not want people to stare at her in the waiting room for fear of them thinking she was crazy. The waiting room had only five people in it, but we took a spot outside that area anyway because we didn't want her getting worse. We tried to calm Jen down, but her breathing was getting worse and she was holding her breath longer and longer. After 30 minutes in the waiting room, Jen did not exhale, and her eyes rolled back in her head. She was rushed to the resuscitation room, and security asked me to wait in the waiting room while Sarah held her hand. Jen was unresponsive to anyone or anything, including pain, pinch, sternum press, etc. They were able to get her breathing normally again, but she was still unresponsive. My girlfriend had a university final in the morning the next day and could not stay with her all night. I came in and sat with Jen while Sarah got some granola bars and water from me. While I was with Jen, she kept looking at something on the ceiling. You could see her eyes shifting to a point, fixate, and then look somewhere else again. She fidgeted, took the breathing tube out of her nose, took her hair tie out too, but she still would not fixate on my eyes or respond when I called her name. When Sarah and I discussed her mama, she stirred more than normal. A sign to me that she might be able to hear us but not respond. Sarah left for the water and food. I talked to Jen and told her she would be all right. When she stirred and looked up and near me, I got up and put my face in front of hers and called her name, but her eyes did not fixate on me at all. She stayed in that condition for two hours. Finally, I began to talk to her in Ukrainian. I told her the words, God sees you and he sees everything. God is here. That's all I said. I looked down and then towards the door, Jen stirred and I looked back to see that she was blinking her eyes. She was awake. Jen was fine after that, but she didn't sleep much that night and only on the couch. She was diagnosed with something, plainly stated, instead of anxiety attacks, these attacks are how her body reacts to too much anxiety. It overreacts. For a person with feet in both worlds, science and spirituality, I can see medically how this is true. We didn't dare tell the doctor what she told us about the shadow people, and we certainly told the nurses many times that she did not take drugs. I put Jen's fears to rest, saying that seeing shadow people does not make her crazy, and in fact, it's almost normal to see them. Listening to podcasts and reading has opened me to know that there are many types of shadow people encounters. I would not have believed this story had I not seen it for myself. If you need verification about this story, there is Sarah though I doubt Jen would want to talk about any more than she already has. The doctor and many others have either prescribed or agreed that Jen's needs for therapy are real to deal with the things in her life. 
Many questions remain unanswered for me, like, why did the girl's spirits throw Jen out of bed? I'm afraid if the spirit of the little girl can take the form of Sarah and knock Jen out of bed, what else can or will it do? What if the girl is not really a spirit, but a devil in disguise, since it can change forms? What about the five small shadow people in her room? Now that they know where Jen is and how she reacts, will they be back? And if so, how soon? What about the Bible warming her up from the inside? And the fact that I mentioned God and seconds later she wakes up from her state. Was this possession? We all hope and pray that Jen goes to see a therapist to deal with the repressed emotions in her life. If this is how her body reacts to extreme fear, then excess fear should be eliminated. Still, this event has Jen encountering a spirit, shadow people, and possibly a demon. After all the podcasts and reading I've done on these subjects, what in the realm of the supernatural is possible after this event? Real Ghost Stories Online. Want a commercial-free experience of the show with access to the world's largest audio archive of ghost stories? Sign up at Apple Podcasts right now and try it for three days free. Ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories.